Hey everybody, I am Kevin Ioli from Yahoo Sports and my next guest is about to train a Bellator world champion, the flyaway champ, Alima Lee McFarlane. How are you? Hi, I'm good, Kevin. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks. Uh, it's good to have you on. Now, you're going to defend uh, your title, which you won last year at Bellator 186 on June 29th, uh, Friday in Temecula, California against Alejandra Lara. Tell us uh, about Lara. For people who haven't seen her, she's one to know in Bellator. For people who haven't seen her, what can we expect in the fight with her? So Alejandra Lara, she's seven and one. So our records are pretty similar. I'm seven and oh. And she trains out of Guadalajara, Mexico with Team Grasso. Uh, Team Grasso has a lot of really high level female uh, training partners for her, like Alexa Grasso, Irene Aldana. Um, so she has a lot of high level female training partners. And I think she has a karate background, uh, which you can kind of see in her last fight. She had that karate stance. And she's also extremely flexible. And I know this, well, besides her doing the splits in all of her fights, you know, for her little celebration dance. Um, she on her social media i see she's like an aerial acrobat girl so extremely flexible extremely athletic really good with her body weight um so yeah that's a that's about as much as i know about her a tough fighter to submit then that sounds like it reminds me of bj penn i mean he was kind of like gumby yeah yeah exactly so it'll be interesting stylistically since i've never faced an opponent like her before so i will say you know maybe maybe her style is my kryptonite we'll see it's been eight months uh, since you defeated Emily Ducote to win the championship. How has life changed, you know, as a champion? It's one fight, but now you have that belt. You have, you know, kind of a target on your back. And just the demands on your time and everything. What's different being a champion as opposed to just being a, a contender? Well, I think there's a lot more trash talking going on, but but not not from me. I think, like like you said, like the target's on my back right now, so... You know, all the other girls are kind of gunning for a, a shot at the title. Um, but that comes with the territory, you know, I have to be prepared for that. Uh, but otherwise, too, like I've been kind of trusted into the spotlight um, a little bit more. I've been doing more appearances, more interviews. Uh, can you hear me okay? I hear you fine, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've been kind of thrust into the spotlight and also into more of a role model position. And I, 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 again, that kind of comes with the territory, but now I have to, um, you know, kind of be a little bit more cognizant of how I act or, or you know, how, how the public perceives me and everything, which is totally fine because I, I kind of welcome that, that um, role model uh, position. I do welcome it. So. You know, the, the one thing that I found, I, I've covered fights for over 30 years, and what I found is, Sometimes when fighters get more notoriety, they concern themselves so much with outside the ring that their performance inside the ring uh, drops. How do you prevent that? I mean, you sound like you're aware of it, that it may happen. So how do you prevent it from yourself that you don't let all the distractions and all the other attention uh, take away from what, what's most important? Yeah, well, you know, I, I know what's expected of me uh, when it comes to training. Uh, you know, I already prepared for a five round war. I did have a fiber on war. So I, I know what's expected of me physically and mentally, emotionally uh, to prepare for a fight. So as long as I'm doing that, as long as I'm listening to my coaches and I'm surrounding myself with the right people who have my best interests at heart, then I, I know I'm gonna be okay. You know, I, I have an amazing team here. I have amazing trainers here at 10 Plant San Diego who, uh, not only are my trainers, but I have a very personal um, relationship with them, you know, which I think is really important because they will tell me if I'm, you know, if I'm not conducting myself in a, the uh, proper way, you know, as champion and they have no problem keeping me in check. Yeah. So, yeah, I think as long as as long as I surround myself with the right people, I keep doing what I'm doing, then, yeah, that prevents me from letting the you know, the splits and the glam and everything um, affect my fighting. You know, I have, uh, I was, you know, I know before you uh, came on with me, you were doing some uh, cleanup around the house and I was doing the same yeah. earlier. And I, I came across a 23andMe box that I bought that I have yet to open. 
Yeah. And you have kind of a connection with that. So uh, tell, tell the story that you discovered an uncle. Uh, your father got a brother via uh, these uh, DNA kits that you could buy. Yeah, that, that's so funny you say that, too, because um, my other half just got a just got one of those DNA kits and he left it out today while I was cleaning. So I put it away. So like, <laughs> I have one too. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's an incredible story. Basically my dad who was born in 41, 42, um, you know, he was kind of like a product of the war mm -hmm. and, uh, especially in Hawaii, um, you know, a bunch of soldiers were, were coming in and out and so anyway he never knew who his biological father was mm. all he had was a name and you know my dad's a stud if you ever see pictures of him big or, guy know, like, right he's big guy total stud handsome hall of fame athlete um and so we've always been curious like who is his father you know so his whole life he's been searching he's been searching for um his biological father and all of a sudden, you know, all these DNA tests started coming out. So all his daughters and his um, son, we all pitched in and decided to buy him all these DNA kits for his, uh, it was either Father's Day or his birthday last year. And so he did it and he started getting all these hits, all these hits. And one day he got a really high match that said, okay, we, you share half of your DNA with this person. We think this person is your half brother. And so he looks at the profile and after some investigating, he's like, oh my goodness, I think this is Robbie. And sure enough, he gives Uncle Robbie a phone call. Uncle Robbie is one of his best friends since sixth grade. They grew up together, <laughs> went to school together. And it's interesting because they are actually like 18 months apart, but they were in the same grade because Uncle Robbie skipped a grade and my dad repeated a grade. So they were on the football team together, graduated together. Um, so it was, it was amazing that turns out my grandma had all these babies and gave them up for adoption, um, you know, during the war. And so it was a really incredible story. And uh, it was funny because we decided to reveal Uncle Robbie to, to the family at my belt party. We threw a big party for, you know, to celebrate my belt. And the news stations were there to cover my the belt. Dude, right. So, yeah, right. But I asked them, I was like, hey, we're going to do this surprise reveal. Do you guys mind? I think it's a really cool story. Do you mind sticking around for it? So they agreed. And it ended up going viral. It was Yeah, incredible. so you were on CNN. Uh, so that, that yeah. was kind of. <laughs> yeah. so the joke is that my dad is more famous than me now. But it's it's still, it was perfect. I'm so happy that it happened how it did. So how, how does it change? Like, you know, he, uh, uncle Robbie was your dad's friend for, you know, most of your life, all of your life really. And all of a sudden now you find out he, he's your uncle. I, you know, what's that like? Is that change your relationship in any way? Oh yeah. I mean, we, of course, like we all hang out all the time now they're attached at the hip. It's, it's so cute. And the cool part about it too, is that, um, so uncle Robbie was doing the test because he never knew who his parents were. So not only did he find out who he, that he shared a mother with my dad, but he also found his biological father and my dad ended up finding his biological oh, father. Wow. And the crazy part is that on, on my dad's uh, biological father's side, he has four more brothers and they all live in California and they're all coming to my fight. And so they're going to meet, they're going to meet each other for the first time at my fight. So that's going to be pretty crazy. So if you're watching the fight on TV and you see these big stud guys all sitting there, you know who they yes. are, right? Yes, exactly. They're no all doubt. The but, you know, I know um, all not was great. I, there was a little bit of a tragedy uh, after after that that came about. You lost your belt. Uh, what happened? And, uh, you know, did, I, I know you got a belt back, uh, but the me were the memories lost because uh, the, the one that you were given in the ring is no longer there? No, not at all. In fact, I think it's, um, it's, it was crazy. I don't want to say it was like a good story, but it, it, it's a good story. You know, it, it's, uh, it taught me a lot. So for any viewers that don't know what happened shortly after the belt party, I went to a different Island to do some photo shoots for sponsors. And I was staying at one of their homes on the, the tarot farm. 
and it's a it's a very traditional old Hawaiian house with thatched roofing, open concept, you know, like wooden poles. And but we were all staying there and I have a love for karaoke unlike any other. And I asked them, <laughs> are there any karaoke bars around here? And so they're like, yeah, we'll take you out. So they took me out to go sing karaoke. And when we came back, the well, entire- Well, not to interrupt you, but who did you sing? Huh, I'm sorry? Who, who did you sing? Who did you do karaoke to? Oh, I always do Picture by a Kid Rock and Sheryl Crow. That's my go-to. Okay. Or uh, Don't You Want Me Baby by Human League. There you That's, go. Those are go-tos. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So anyways. No, no, not at all. Um, so we come back home and the whole house is completely on fire. There was nothing we could have done to try and mm. grab our stuff, nothing. And, you know, it was crazy because, yes, my belt was in there, um, but we had a videographer with us that was documenting, you know, my visit up there. So all of his camera equipment, very expensive equipment was in there and we're just mm. completely floored. We didn't know what to do. Um, so yeah, I, I, I took a picture or, and I immediately texted uh, Bellator. I texted uh, Rich too and, and Mike Kogan them and I'm just like, hey, so what happens if uh, my belt gets burned in a fire? <laughs> the, the fire department, they ended up finding it the next day and they recognized it because they had some of the rhinestones or some of, you know, um, still on it. So they're like, Hey, is this your belt? And it's just completely melted mass. Of, it looks like a rock. Mm. Um, so I saved it, but you know, that whole experience ordeal kind of just, it, it was a metaphor almost. And it would, it taught me that even though I don't have the belt physically, it doesn't take away anything. I'm still a champion. Yeah. You know, the, the accomplishment. Yeah. The belt doesn't define me. And we have a joke that I already lost. The, I, I tried to defend my belt already, but I lost it in the fire. So this is technically my second title defense. Or, yeah, we're just, so it, it was a interesting experience. But um, yeah, Bellator was so gracious and they, they surprised me with the belt uh, when I came back home. We can say you're in the record books for having lost a title without ever having a title defense. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there you go. And so, that like, line from now on. <laughs> not, not what you really want, though. So yeah. anyway, anyway, so. Where do you go uh, from here? Let, let's assume that you uh, defend the title successfully. Uh, you know, that's when they say when you, you're you really a champion when you make your first title defense. If you do that, uh, what's on the horizon? For you? Well, if I do that, okay, so I have a few answers. If they ask me on the mic what's next, you know, if I, if I win, then I'm going to say that I want Bellator Hawaii because we never had a Bellator in Hawaii and I've never fought in Hawaii. And I just think that would be incredible. So I'm going to try to try to uh, advocate for Bellator Hawaii. And I would also like my own bobblehead because I think it's time that they make a female bobblehead. Oh, wait a minute. I just want to show you something here. I used this as a prop once before, but we're going to just show this again. And so it, you don't have to be a fighter to have a bobblehead. There you go. I'm gonna tell them I need a bobblehead. Yeah. No, no doubt. You, they gotta get you a bobblehead. Um, just, just one or one or two other things then. Um, as you know, as you go in Bellator and you say you want to have a fight in Hawaii, why do you think it has not been there? I know Strike Force years ago and uh, Elite XC was in Hawaii. Max Holloway, the UFC featherweight champion, thing you know campaigning for a fight in Hawaii, and I know Dana White for a little bit tried to work to get it there. Why hasn't it happened? I mean, Hawaii would seem a place a lot of people would want to go to watch a fight. See, a, it seemed like a logical place. Why hasn't it happened? You know, I'm really not sure. I've heard several things. Um, one is like the time change might be difficult uh, because Hawaii is like three hours behind. And so in order for it to work with the mainland time, they would have to have the show really early. But then that would mean that people would still be at work, you know, the actual on Hawaii, Friday, yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, so I've heard stuff like that. I've heard it's also difficult to be um, shipping over equipment for the production of it. And and then as far, you know, with the UFC, I know that the Tourism Bureau or whatever, um, there was some issues with them. Like they were kind of uh, not supportive of the idea. So I don't know. It's I think it's a, it's a mixture of things, but... You know, I feel like Bellator is 
is an innovator. And especially since I've been with them, you know, they've been doing, you know, the MMA shows and the kickboxing shows together. And, you know, we start, we created the women's flyweight division. We crowned the first champion. So it's like the first show in Hawaii, like the first big show. So, um, yeah, I mean, logistically, I think that's the biggest problem. It was just the logistics. And I think people want it. And just let me ask you, since we mentioned fighting in Hawaii, uh, you know, I, I mentioned BJ Penn in passing before. A, as a Hawaiian, how much did he mean to you as a fighter? Uh, BJ, a legendary guy in, in the industry, and a lot of people, you know, list BJ Penn as their idol. But for a Hawaiian who is an MMA fighter, what does he mean to you? Oh, yeah, he's like a god back home, you know. And uh, I admit that I didn't get into MMA until much later, like pretty much when he was out of the, mm. of the business. And so, I, I mean, like, I didn't really start watching MMA until a few years ago either. But, of course, I knew who BJ was. I knew about his accomplishments. I thought he was incredible. He was that um, big that even if you weren't an MMA fan, you knew who he was. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, he's, uh, he's what everybody who fights aspires to be, you know, one of the greatest of all time, and especially coming from Hawaii. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he means a lot. I actually listen to his walkout music before I go out, um, it's one of my like pump up songs, even though it's really slow, I just get so pumped up when I listen to it. I get, I actually get pretty emotional too. I'll start singing it and I'll start tearing or whatever, but yeah, it's just that he's a, he's a source of pride and, and honor and respect. Awesome. Well, you are a source of pride to many in uh, Hawaii. I know that. I wish you good luck uh, on June 29th in your title defense against Alejandra Lara. All the best, and we appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Kevin. By the way, how do you see your last name? Ioli. Kevin Ioli. Ioli. That's so funny because uh, it, I actually thought it was Hawaiian at first when I saw it. A lot of people have asked me that, yeah. Yeah, but we pronounce it Iole, and uh, it's, a, it's actually the Hawaiian word for rat. <laughs> a lot of people have called me that after they've read stories I've written, so I guess that's uh, accurate. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Liam. I appreciate you. All right, thanks, Kevin.